microphone, and so we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you could let them know you'd like to ask something, and uh, we'll try to answer uh, any questions you might have. Uh, my name is Scott Sackett, and uh, we look forward to taking your questions. Tyler, are you going to join us? Ah. Oh. Okay, we have a gentleman here with a question. Yes, Fred Solms from uh, Russell, Pennsylvania. Something is, I wonder about years and years. All this hydroelectric power, where does it go? Oh, I'll tell you, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We wondered that question. Nobody seems to know. No one, no one seems to know. We, we've, we've investigated it as much as we could. Uh, we didn't find an exact answer. Uh, it goes back into the grid. Uh, the best we could find up it was it was for industrial development uh, in the Ohio Valley and in Pennsylvania. Uh, but I don't know if you can track exactly where that hydropower goes. That's a good question. I was told by a former public employee. He told me that not one kilowatt, or whatever you call it, goes into the state of Pennsylvania. That nothing whatsoever. Most of it goes into, I don't understand this, Ohio. We, we did hear much of it did go to Ohio as well. That is something we heard. Now I stand up and you go. Um, okay, my you name is Heron. Thank you. That was a very um, eye-opening documentary. Um, I have a question. I wondered uh, about the popul populace of the Seneca Nation. Um, can you tell me how many folks are still in Pennsylvania, New York? Uh, we're have about 5,000 enrolled Senecas right now. Um, about 3,500 live on our reservations at Cataraugus, Allegheny, Oil Springs. Um, many work in uh, Buffalo, got to spread around the country. At the time of Kinsey, there was probably maybe just 2,000 enrolled Senecas and primarily lived down in Cataraugus, Allegheny, Oil Springs, and approximately about 150 on a corn planter track. And uh, that's like anybody else had to work for a living to put food on the table. So uh, Buffalo was a place of employment back in the late 50s and 60s. So there were a lot of scientists employed at the GM plant, the Ford plant, and whatnot. Um, so our population is expanding, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but <laughs> The government had their way. Uh, we would have been assimilated and we wouldn't have had any identity. We'd have been just like a brown face in the mass of millions. But we do have an identity. We have a culture, a living culture, a living language. Uh, there's the pride in who we are. Uh, the consume was one of the low points of Seneca history. The um, you watch the burning homes on the uh, on the film. That's not the first time our village has been burned. Sullivan and Broadhead came up through the uh, Allegheny. Sullivan came up the Delaware River, and Clinton came along the Mohawk River with one purpose, and that's with the destroy the Senecas. This was during the Revolutionary War. So it's not the first time we burned out. We still survived. And the second time was uh, the Buffalo Creek Treaty, fraudulent where they took our land, approximately our own buffalo for economic purposes, a year to now and whatnot, and they burned our homes there. So, <laughs> I hope this is the last time. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm an advocate of, of our land, much like others, is that they don't make it every day. 
we've got a hole on what we had. Uh, there's some land on there in our reservation below 1365, which hasn't been flooded since 1972. And I'm an advocate of reselling that land, moving back down there to Red House, forming those communities again. Uh, but I have some skeptics that tell me, well, what are you going to do about the Corps of Engineers? I said, what are we going to do? They're not, <laughs> they burned us up before it. And I'd like to see them try it again. So, uh, I don't know, I'm going to ramble on here, but one of the things that you've read a lot about the Corps of Engineers and watched it on here that responsible for the dam building, uh, engineering, but they were military men for the military train of thought. I'm going to read an editorial from May, May 4th, uh, 1964, from the Warren Times, Warren Times Mirror. And there was a big conference, economic conference, what they're going to do for economic resources for the dam. Well, of course, the Sonic Nation had to be included because it was along our land. But also, there was a Colonel Jameson there from the uh, Corps of Engineers. And in this editorial, the Warren Times Mirror is taking the, this Colonel to task for some of the remarks that he made at this meeting, which Jamin said charged the Seneca Indians who had been kicked off their land as a matter of routine if the press had not made a big deal out of it. As a matter of routine, military man speaking like that. Native Americans, well, what does he mean a matter of routine? Militarily? You know, I, I, I look back at what the military has done to Native people across the country prior to, and I, and I look at wounded knee. Is that a matter of routine? So, you know, we have an army colonel, and it's got to take into effect. Uh, Custer's last name was even 100 years old yet. So, was that military thinking as a matter of routine? We'll burn us out, get us out of there, and put us in internment camps, so decide what we're going to do with us? You know, that's a scary statement to be made. And I don't have a problem with engineers, but when you have military people in charge, of, and that, that was a train of thought in 1964. Our sacred treaty was under attack by the financial institutions, the bureaucracy institutions, the political institutions of this country. And, it, and the reason that we, we won some battles was because there were people that had a, that thought of that treaty as a, as a moral obligation. There was a father of the country, George Washington, by the way, the Seneca word for the president is Nundagonios. Seneca means he burns villages. <laughs> that was from the Sullivan campaign. So when we talk about the president's Nundagonios, but people, and, and, uh, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower had a, he vetoed the first appropriation bill because he knew it was gonna abrogate that treaty would break George Washington's word. So Eisenhower was a, a man of morality, wanted to do the right thing. And if you look back at, what was this, uh, beware of the military industrial, you know, what, what is that? What does that mean? It, it, it was right between the eyes that got us. So we still hold that treaty sacred today, November 11th. We have a treaty uh, commemoration, uh, parade and speech making and whatnot in Canada, but well attended. But every November 11th, we, there's, a, there's some kind of representative from the United States there, whether it be a staff member or whatever. But the first question he asks is, uh, who's here from the United States, representing the United States? And some people step forward, give a little speech. Every year we get a nudie cloth. It might not be much, it's just plain muzzle, but the significance of it is that the United States still honors that treaty. And we as Seneca still honor ourselves by doing that beauty cloth. So I, I, I look at that film and 
I, I lived it. I was 17 years old. I, I watched my home burn. My mother come got me. I stayed in that home as long as I could. She said, you got to come back. you got to move out of there and come up to the, to the new house. And a couple days later, they burned the house. You know, I could tell you stories. Of, I got two friends that were having a couple of beers. and They're, they're older guys. And they were burning houses. They decided there's no army corps going to burn our houses. They're going to burn them down themselves. So, <laughs> so when you mention army corps engineers, it's a it's a really a sore point with a lot of the older generation. Um, we had I can remember 15, 16 years old. Some of our Seneca older ladies chasing them off their property with brooms, <laughs> whacking them with brooms. Get out of my property! So. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you heard on there that, uh, you know, we call it Mother Earth. And we, when we have ceremonies, we have a speech maker gets up and says, you know you on Seneca, and it's thanking Mother Earth and the universe around us for all that it's given us. So, but I just wanted to pass that on. If anybody's got any questions, uh, I've got stories to tell. Um, yes. Is this better? Okay. I got some of the insights of the Corps engineers away from this area. Uh, basically, the Corps was a very honest few people up here. And, but part of the things they talked about was to have an effective flood control was a dam. You had to be within 50 miles of the city. This, gar this stuff about this being flood control up here is garbage for Pittsburgh. They've had big fun since then. The next thing we talked about was they, as you people notice, they start lowering the water level at, on Kinzu mid-August to mid-September. They're using that water down to keep the locks going between Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. That was one of the big things that they wanted to dam for was to keep the locks going so the steel companies at the time could get ore up the river and get steel down the river. My big question to the core guys at the time was, how many steel plants are left in Pittsburgh? This, I was asking this about 1990. And of course they said, there isn't any. And I said, well, would the dam be built today? And he said, no. You know, one of the things about the uh, Kinzu is that during the summer months, the Allegheny River would get so low down around Pittsburgh and all the environmental uh, from the coal mines and the ore mines and whatnot would leak into the river. And it would actually rust the barges. Yes. It would rust the barges and the, the reservoir acted as a as a water source to dilute the, the pollution coming from the mines. That's why they didn't want that Conalongo thing to go through because they, didn't, they wanted to keep the water up here so they could flush things out and keep the, the locks going. You mentioned Conawango, our Seneca name for this village is Conawango. It means rapid water, Conawango. Um, Pittsburgh, Jondega, Cold Spring, Jondega, no, corn planter. So, well, you know, when we talk about corn planter, I'm gonna, this is an interesting story about the Kinzu. Uh, corn planter was buried on his land, and it came time for grave removal. And the Corps of Engineers were so afraid that the corn planter would be a vocal point, a focus point on, on protesters, protesters. And they didn't want any kind of uh, upheaval. And um, there was a person from Salamanca who owned property where Webb's Ferry is right now, and he wanted to donate that land to, uh, to rebury corn planter there. Well, when the Corps found out about it, they condemned that land and made that little boat landing on it. So basically, in the middle of the night, the Corps of Engineers re relocated corn planters to Corridon without the okay of the corn planter heirs. And of course, nobody really thought about it or thought about it, but they removed corn planter there without any permission. So, about 20 years ago, the Cord Cordon Cemetery was eroding, and there was going to be a big meeting over in the Haley Building at Seneca Nation. And 
Corps of Engineers showed up with a team of attorneys, and there's some Senecas waiting for them, and what they were going to talk about was the erosion of the Corps and Cemetery. But the Army Corps of Engineers thought it was going to be about relocating Corps planner and raising some old issues. So even 25 years ago, there was a conflict there, and the Corps of Engineers uh, still still worried about Corps planner and what that meant to other Senecas and them being, him being a bull point even today. Uh, American Legion Corps Planner, American Legion, as you go further down, Guy Suta, uh, Corps Planner's uncle. I think there's fire companies, schools named after Guy Suta. So the, the Seneca history along the river, you know, it, it runs deep. And the Corps of Engineers, they, it's, uh, I don't know whether it's cowboys and Indians with them back in the day or whatever. It, it's just, you know, it, it's better to, it's a matter of routine. You know, th those are scary words. So I, you know, I talked about my father uh, being a narrator of land of our ancestors, and, and I never saw my father cry. I never saw him break down. He got happy through the speech after, and held his eyes and walked off. And I, I never felt so much anger. I cried myself, and, and there's somebody in the but I reached over and punched him. But you know, that's the feeling yet today. There's a lot of people who have a mistrust of the Corps of Engineers. You know, I say the, the United States is in the business of building dams and doing harnessing energy. Put in civilian hands. Leave the military to the military, you know, military thing, not for civilians. So Well, one of the things I asked the Corps people I was dealing with is kin to a white elephant. And they basically said, you wouldn't respond. You would not respond to this. Do we have uh, any, any other questions out there? Yes. Yeah, we do have one. I'm getting the mic to her. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask, what was the alternative route that they were going to, that the Seneca wanted to offer up. And I also wanted to tell you my mother was full-blooded Seneca. All five of her children are here today, all of us right here. And we are the Fair Claim. So, yes. And I also wanted to tell you, as the dam was going on, my mother was having each one of us. So at 57, I was born. My brother was born at 60. So I really never knew all this, what do you want to call, negativity to the great length that I saw on this program tonight. And I, I'm only half, but it saddens me that this stuff is still going on today. And to feel, um, I was volunteering somewhere in the Corps of India, what you were talking about, came in and he was telling a story about how the Senecas don't like them. I get it now. I totally understand. So the next time I see him, I'm not going to get it. You know what I'm saying? Explain it to him. Uh, yeah, exactly. So if you would tell me what the alternative route was that we wanted to offer, I'd like to know. Thank well, you. Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, there, there, Morgan actually came up with multiple plans because the plans con were continually rejected um, as, as unfeasible. Uh, but the, the, the main route, they were going to build uh, uh, basically a, a, a slight feeder canal out of the um, Allegheny that would drain into the Conowango Valley. And that would, it was a natural depress depression, uh, geological depression from the Ice Age, I believe. And then uh, a, uh, it, would, it would take the, um, uh, which creek was it, Scotty? Uh, it takes, uh, the, not Cataraugus Creek. Uh, it would take a creek out, was it Silver Creek? Would take, a, the, that would be the, 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 drain, the actual drainage out of the uh, Conowango Reservoir uh, into Lake Erie. The excess water would go out through the, that creek. Uh, but, but Morgan actually, they, he came up with multiple plans. Um, each one at every turn was rejected, um, and 
I mean, there's there's the, there's the question. As I think at dinner tonight, Tyler had said, I, I don't. I wonder if um, that would today pass the environmental uh, studies that would be necessary. If, but in but in the day, to simply not look at the alternatives and to to pass them off as um, ineffective, uh, not 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 a, not a feasible solution. When I, I think it's quite clear in the film that there are other other things at play, and and you had mentioned the fact that um, not understanding or not knowing the story, um, I think that's a, for us, for Scott and I, uh, making this film. That was one of the, the, the most important things for for us to to bring this story. Uh, to, a, to a wider audience because people ask me all the time, so what are you, what are you working on? What project are you working on? I said, oh, I'm working on a film about uh, the story, the backstory of Kinsella Dam and what happened. And, that, and the response I would always get was, ah, oh, I love Kinsella. I love the reservoir. I go fishing there all the time. Which is fine. I, I don't mind fishing. Um, but I say, you know, do you, well, do you know the story behind it? Well, I know what story. I said, well, do you know what's under those waters? Do you have any idea what's under those waters? And so, it goes, and, and, and people don't realize. They go there all the time. They, they go down there. They go out on the, on the water. They, they, they boat. They, they fish. They have a good time. They have picnics by the, by the shore and have no idea of what lies below. And for us, Kind of bringing those voices up from under the water was an important thing, and we wanted. We, we were just hoping that it does reach a wider audience as a result. Uh, I've got my wife with me, Shirley, and my sister Gloria. Uh, my wife was born in Oneville, born at home. And on the way down here, we came up over through Scandia, looked out on where she was. house has been underwater since 1965, and probably 20 foot of water on it right now, in the summertime probably 40 foot. But uh, she was born at home, she's, uh, I don't know how many great granddaughters a corn planter she is. Uh, my sister Gloria is a peacemaker for a judge in the, uh, Kind of connection travel system. Um, but I, I just want to, there's a before and after here. Um, and I say this uh, 15, 16, 17 years old. You look at things in the future, and your future has a broad horizon that the sun's just rising on it. But our elders at the time had lived their future, and in their future, the sun was setting. And you're young, you don't realize at the time, what hurt and pain they went through. Now I'm seven years old, my, my son's <laughs> setting a little bit. And I look back, especially a film like this, and I, I can understand the hurt that our elders went through, the, the pain of, of giving up your home, not giving up, taking away. Uh, within a four years time, I don't know how many elders we lost. And I say it was to a broken heart. But uh, now I'm, I'm old, and they're not old, but you know, I'm like highly middle aged. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a great grandchild, but one thing that we do, our generation from the Kinzu, we preach don't let it happen again. Don't let it happen again. But I say this what we went through, there's a before and after. The after is that. Uh, I think on the film it referred to the lake it serves as a symbol to to what happened to us and also as a catalyst for the Seneca Nation to, to look back and use as a catalyst for the future. Well, if you, uh, right now, we're prospering. We have businesses, we have uh, a casino, <laughs> three of them. <laughs> and, and, and what's happened uh, back in the middle 60s, you could count the college educated people on one hand. Now we have we have doctors, doctors, lawyers, 
Indian chiefs. <laughs> um, so it's really a transformation, and it, it, we, instead of fighting uh, our battles with bows and arrows, we're fighting with legal briefs, uh, uh, PR, you know, public relations, and things like that. We, we've learned to cope with that dominant society. And I think we're doing a pretty good job. At, at one time, uh, our language is almost lost, but the resources that we have are being directed to bring our language back. Uh, people are more aware of who they are than people out there probably being a fair plan. And, and it's, you know, it's, that's what we have as a, a reawakening. And I think our ancestors from the Kinsuke days that passed on with those broken hearts to look at this, these generations and, and they, they would smile and be proud. Uh, and there's one young man down here. His father and I are about the same age, played basketball sports together all through the, through the years and lived the Kinsuke Dam uh, relocation upheaval. This young man's a testament to, to a newer generation of Seneca, educated. Uh, it works in a technology field, uh, helping Scott and Paul. So that, that's, that's the Seneca of today. And of course, but it's always in the background. Don't let it happen again. Don't let it happen again. We had our, remember the removal. We have every year, the last Saturday of the month of September. And it's always well attended. Younger people show up. They want to hear the old stories. Oh, it used to be. And that's a good thing because that acts as that catalyst to, for our future. We want our young people to have their sun just rising on their, on their future of who they are and what they want to be. So, again, uh, to people that use our casinos, thank you. <laughs> for those of you who go to the smoke shops, thank you. We do have one more question here. Sit down. Yes. Uh, before I state my question, I'd like to mention a couple of, of asides. One of them, um, by the way, that was a wonderful film. It was very well made. And people here remember that scene where that church steeple hobbles down amidst the flat. It was the Methodist church right in the center of Kinzu. And my house was located right across the street from it where Route 59 used to go right through the center of town. My people are from Kinzu, by the way. And if the saying of heaven on earth, if there was such a place, it would have been Kinzu, the most beautiful little village in America. The other aside I want to mention is I had occasion some 30 or some years ago to visit the cemetery that uh, King uh, Chief Cornplan has buried. His gravesite is marked by an obelisk. And written on that obelisk states that the Chief Cornplanter was not a Seneca Indian, and he wasn't even an Indian, he was a Dutchman. Perhaps the gentleman on the stage would like to comment on that. Now, I'll ask my question first. Here it is over a half a century after the building of the dam, that whole episode is far behind us now. What is the purpose of gathering this? And by the way, I've never seen this theater packed to the brim as it is tonight. So there's a great interest in this episode. And what is the purpose of the showing tonight? Is there some form of new legal action that's being taken in retrospect of how the Indians were done done wrong over 50 years ago? That's my question. <laughs> well, um, there's, there's uh, no, no major legal actions or anything taking place. Um, it, it's being shown through the generosity of the Warren uh, Historical Society. Um, and this is a beautiful theater. <laughs> this is a, a magnificent venue. And uh, when, I, when I first heard it was going to be held in a library theater, I thought, oh, a nice little library, you know, 50 people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was absolutely, uh, uh, we all were absolutely amazed and astounded at the turnout for tonight, and it's truly humbling. Um, and uh, I, I certainly am touched by the outpouring, and uh, I, 
want to just thank you. Thank you for coming out. It's been wonderful. Um, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's really, we, we, we're showing it tonight through the generous, generosity of the Historical Society. We wanted to have a screening in Warren. We felt it was important in Warren. Uh, it's, it's where the dam is located, and there are so many communities that were lost in the vicinity. Um, you mentioned Kinzu, Corydon, uh, there's Onoville, so many, so many communities that uh, were just wiped away. And we understand that you know, we're telling a Seneca story here, but it's also, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger story in some, in some ways. It's, it's, it's an American story, an unfortunate American story. Um, and we've always believed that this crosses cultural borders. Um, we know what it's like to feel, like Mike Frisch said, why powerful people just can't understand a simple, you know, come to a solution, come to the table and find a solution. It can be, it can happen. But, you know, unfortunately, money and politics kind of get in the way and, and for the most part. So we always felt that this, although it is a Seneca story, a, a tragic Seneca story, it does cross cultural borders in, in so many ways, as so many of you may have been affected by, by the dam itself and the relocation and forced to leave your homes and find new, find new places to live. Okay, thank you everyone for coming this evening. We really appreciate it. Travel safe. Have a great day.